What are the origins of human civilization? And where did it all begin? The Bible tells of the creation of man in God's image from the dust of the earth, of a fabulous garden in which Adam and Eve lived, and their banishment from the earthly paradise. Their exile from the Garden of Eden heralded the birth of civilization. Archaeology tells a different creation story in which man is the product of evolution and civilization was born in the Neolithic age when men and women first began to control the natural world around them. And so with the advent of science and logic, many scholars have consigned the story of the Garden of Eden to the realms of mythology. But is it really just a piece of fiction, or is there more to it than that? If you look closely at the Genesis story, there are clues to show that the Garden of Eden was a real physical place on this earth. I'm going to take you on a journey, a journey in search of paradise. I'm David Roll. As a historian who studies the ancient world, I've spent the last 25 years trying to unravel the hidden history behind many of the world's greatest ancient legends. And now I'm here in Oxford University, investigating what claims to be the oldest legend of all, the biblical story of the Garden of Eden. The book of Genesis claims that God created a garden in the east of Eden where he settled Adam and Eve. There they prospered, raising sons, Cain the farmer and Abel the shepherd. But Adam and Eve were tempted by the serpent to disobey God's command and were expelled out of Eden. The modern secular version of man's beginnings does tell of a great creative moment in human history, also 7,000 years ago when Stone Age hunter-gatherers gave up their wandering existence to settle in farming communities. Anthropologists call this crucial turning point the Neolithic Revolution. With the Neolithic Revolution, things changed drastically. People started to domesticate animals, put them in fields around the, the homesteads, and they were actually growing crops. So this was a major breakthrough. It's basically the foundation stone upon which the historical civilizations are built. It seems that archaeology and the Bible agree that something spectacular happened around 7,000 years ago. So are the stories of Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel just myths? Or could they simply be the Bible's version of this Neolithic revolution? And if so, did the Garden of Eden really exist? One of the most important pieces of evidence to show that Eden did exist and where it might be located has been staring us in the face for generations. It's just that in recent years, we haven't really bothered to take it seriously. The crucial passage which pinpoints the location of Eden is found in the second chapter of the book of Genesis. And it's a fairly straightforward, matter-of-fact geographical description. No miracles here. God planted a garden in the east of Eden, and there he put the man he had fashioned. From, From the, the soil, soil God, God caused, caused to grow every kind of tree, enticing to look at and good to eat, with the tree of life in the middle of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed from Eden to water the garden and there it divided to make four heads. The first is named Pishon, winding all through the land of Havilah, rich in gold. The gold of this country is pure. Bdellium and Shoham stone are found there. The second river is named Gihon and this winds all through the land of Cush. The third river is named Hidekel, and this flows to the east of Asher. The fourth river is the Perath.
This is a very information-rich piece of text. Perhaps most important of all, it tells us that we should be looking for two places, not just one. First, there's an area called Eden, and we have a number of geographical clues as to where that is. And second, we're looking for a garden, which is in the eastern part of Eden. The Bible informs us that Eden's whereabouts is tied up with the location of four rivers. We've always known the identities of the Perath and Hiddekel. These are the famous rivers the Greeks called Euphrates and Tigris, flowing through ancient Mesopotamia, now modern Iraq. The problem has always been identifying the other two rivers, the Gihon and the Pishon. Early church scholars read in Genesis that the river Gihon flowed through the land of Cush. But where was Cush? The only Cush they knew was in Africa, south of the land of the pharaohs, in what we now call Sudan and Ethiopia. They therefore assumed that the Gihon had to be the Nile. Of course, if the Gihon was as far away from the Tigris and Euphrates as the Nile, it made sense to look much further afield for the Pishon. And so they decided on either the Indus or Ganges rivers in the Indian subcontinent. As a result, early scholars concluded that Eden encompassed the whole of the ancient world, stretching all the way from Africa to India. But this surely isn't what the Genesis text is telling us. We read that mankind was banished from Eden, exiled to eke out a sorry existence beyond the boundaries of the earthly paradise. So the boundaries of Eden can't possibly encompass the whole of the ancient world. If we're to find Eden and its fabled garden, we need to be thinking on a very different scale, something much smaller and more specific. And this is the modern view. Scholars today believe that Eden was located where the Tigris and Euphrates once joined two other local rivers flowing out into the Persian Gulf, and where, conveniently, the first signs of human civilization appear in the archaeological record. But however convenient this might be, I'm not convinced they're right. There's a crucial clue here in the original Hebrew text of Genesis 2. A river flowed from Eden to water the garden, and from there it divided to make four heads. The Hebrew word for head is rosh, as in Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, which actually means the head of the year. In other words, the beginning, not the end of the year. So in Genesis 2, where the plural Roshim is used, I think it has to refer to the beginnings, the sources or headwaters of the four rivers of Eden. We should be looking for Eden, where the sources of four major rivers diverge from the highland watershed, not where they emerge into the sea. The sources of the Tigris and Euphrates are located in a mountainous region between eastern Turkey and western Iran. If I'm right, Eden must be somewhere around here, and so must the headwaters of the other two rivers. Ancient Mesopotamia was located in the fertile plain between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. Genesis 2.10 The Bible names the Tigris and Euphrates as the rivers of Eden. And the Bible names two non-existent rivers that also meet at the same point the Pison and Gihon. The question becomes, did these rivers once exist, springing from the same source as the Tigris and Euphrates in ancient times? The answer may come from a higher source, space. Satellite imagery was the key to the location of Eden. That when I began to work on it, it was the beginning of space imaging. Now the technology is allowing me to see something from space. Maybe I can get better pictures. The satellites revealed not just two rivers, but all four rivers of the Bible. And they meet in Samaria, the site of the Epic of Gilgamesh. The other two rivers that are mentioned in the story are rivers that no longer exist, but did at one time. Rivers that can be called fossil rivers.
The only way to find out is to go there and see what we can discover. Time then to leave England and head for Iran, where 7,000 years ago, man set out on the road to civilization. Our search for paradise has brought us 3,000 miles east from the dreaming spires of Oxford to one of the most powerful Islamic countries of the 21st century, Iran. We've come in search of the Garden of Eden, the existence of which is accepted by three of the world's great religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Today, the Republic of Iran is an Islamic state, following the overthrow of the last Persian monarch in 1979. But this part of the world has a long and illustrious history. The Middle East is a land of legends, and epic legends, unlike myths, were based on real historical events. But historians have nevertheless identified much more ancient legends which show clear parallels to the stories in the book of Genesis. The stories themselves were well known in the ancient world. It's interesting that when you come to the creation of man in the ancient stories, this was a sort of afterthought, whereas Genesis sees the creation of man as the climax of God's activity. And it's not just ancient written legends which find echoes in the biblical story. This extraordinary cylinder seal, found in Mesopotamia and now in the British Museum, is over 4,000 years old. When its hidden image is rolled out, it reveals a male figure sitting on a throne. Opposite him is a female figure, and between them a tree heavily laden with fruit. And behind the female, there's a serpent. Could this be the oldest representation of the temptation of Adam and Eve? It's when you're in a place like this that you can suddenly be reminded of something which is of course blindingly obvious, but often easy to forget. The Bible wasn't originally written in English. And those words that we're so used to, when analyzed in their original language, can sometimes give us a rather different understanding of the text. For instance, the original Hebrew for Garden of Eden is Gan Be'eden. And the word Gan is a specific type of garden, a walled or enclosed garden. The Persians also had a word to describe an enclosed parkland or royal garden. They called it Parideza, and it's from this we get our word paradise. The legacy of the walled garden and the four rivers of paradise is all around us. We're standing on the balcony of the King's Palace in magical Isfahan, and right down there is the royal garden. It's exactly the sort of thing we've been talking about. You can see how we have the great enclosure wall encircling the garden, and a fountain and a pool. Now that's like the spring waters of the original Garden of Eden with the four channels dividing up this garden into four quarters. They call it the fourfold garden, or Persian garden. And it's this basic architectural style which is reflected in another very special building, the Taj Mahal. But how did the Persian Paradise Garden end up in India? In 1218 AD, the legendary Mongol emperor Genghis Khan swept through Persia sacking and looting. But as is often the way, the conqueror was seduced by the riches and culture of the conquered. When Genghis Khan's descendants went on to found the mighty Mughal Empire in India, they brought with them the Persian concept of paradise. This culminated in Shah Jahan's celebrated masterpiece of Mughal architecture. Written above the entrance arch to the Taj Mahal are the words, you are entering paradise. The Paradise Garden is divided into four quarters, with the pool at its heart, 
and the four channels representing the rivers of Eden flowing out from the center. Beyond is the gleaming white dome of the Taj itself, representing the throne of glory, the biblical snow-capped mountain of God. Shah Jahan's magnificent recreation of paradise was built by a Persian architect. But where did Persia get its concept of the Garden of Paradise? Could it have come from a much older tradition already well and truly established in the region. Time to head south to the Mesopotamian plain where human civilization first took root. Nizam? Hi. Because we're going to be confronted by a number of local dialects on our journey, Nizam is going to be our interpreter. Salam. Salam. Good to see you. Thank you. Here we go. Come on. We're heading for the ancient land of Sumer. The Sumerians were the first great civilization in the world, even predating the pharaohs of Egypt. Their origins are shrouded in mystery, but towards the end of the Neolithic Revolution in 5000 BC, we find them settled in the Mesopotamian plain, along the banks of two of the Genesis rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates and it's there that they begin to build the earliest cities on Earth. The Sumerians then construct huge platform temples called ziggurats, which ascend in giant steps to the house of the city god at the summit. Did these people build artificial mountains on the plain in order to replace the mountain homes of their gods? And if so, does this imply that the Sumerians themselves originally came to Mesopotamia from the mountains? Certainly these people seem to have been closely connected to the lands of the north, high up in the Zagros Mountains. So much so that they've even left us a 4,000 year old guidebook. Actually it's an ancient Sumerian epic poem entitled Enmer Kar and the Lord of Arata. It tells of the Sumerian king Enmer Kar, who sent an envoy to deliver a message to the ruler of a mysterious land far off to the north. His destination was the kingdom of Arata overflowing with gold and precious stones. And of course, Genesis also describes part of Eden as being rich in gold and precious stones. Nobody is quite sure where the kingdom of Arata was, but even if we don't know where the journey ended, we do know where it began. Through the mountain passes of Loristan, we make it up where at the village nearby us. According to the story on the tablet, the envoy's journey began in Susa, an ancient city on the broad plain of the river Kirka in southwestern Iran. And it's here too, 5,000 years later, that we'll begin our journey to Arata, following in the envoy's footsteps. The emissary gave heed to the word of his king. By the starry night he journeyed, by day he travelled with the sun god, Utu of heaven. From Susa to the Anshan mountain land, the teeming multitudes grovelled in the dust. Five gates, six gates, seven gates he traversed. He lifted up his eyes as he approached Arata. The emissary, journeying to Arata, covered his feet with the dust of the road and stirred up the pebbles of the mountains. Like a huge serpent prowling about the plain, he was unopposed. On his long journey to Arata, the envoy passed through seven gates, now gates in the ancient world were mountain passes or gorges through the mountain ranges. There might be a connection here with the ancient Jewish tradition of seven levels of heaven culminating in the throne of glory. 
Here in this medieval ivory carving, we see the seven levels of paradise, with Adam and Eve standing beside the tree of life in the seventh heaven. Even today, we still say we're in seventh heaven, meaning we're in paradise. It may seem a bit odd using a piece of Sumerian literature to locate the biblical Eden, but there is an important clue in here. Quite a long way into the story, we find the envoy nearing his final destination, the kingdom of Arata. He descends from the mountains onto a broad rolling plain, the plain of Arata. And it's this word plain that's interesting here. The Sumerian word is Edin, and it's from Edin and that most scholars believe the biblical Eden derives. Dr. Irvin Finkel is the Sumerian expert at the British Museum. It seems to be fairly clear that the Hebrew word Aden, from which the English Eden obviously derives, the biblical word, itself comes from a Sumerian word, which is usually written or usually spelt E-D-E-N or E-D-I-N, Edin, which was the word used in cuneiform um, Sumerian inscriptions for the, the steppe land um, outside a settlement, outside a town, which is over the border of the cultivated area. That was what they considered the Edin. So Eden simply means plain or uncultivated land. Now that we've entered the Kurdish mountains, we find a way of life hardly changed in thousands of years. Here you can begin to get a real sense of what the ancient world of Genesis was like. So far, we've completed a day's drive through the first four gates on the envoy's journey to Arata. It would probably have taken him the best part of one month to cover the same ground on foot. The problem is that we're not sure which direction he went in next. Just a short distance from here is a remarkable place. If it wasn't for what happened there a little less than 200 years ago, we wouldn't be on this journey at all. If the Garden of Eden ever existed, I'm convinced that it could only have been high up in the Zagros Mountains. And that's where we're heading. We're following in the footsteps of a royal envoy who journeyed to the mountain kingdom of Arata. Having traversed seven mountain ranges, he arrived at a place called the Edin, which I believe to be a Sumerian reference to the biblical Eden. But the envoy's epic tale would have remained lost to us had it not been for the extraordinary endeavours of an English army captain, Henry Rawlinson. In 1844, Rawlinson was exploring the ancient monuments of Persia. High up on the rock face at Behistun, he could just make out the spectacular inscription of the Persian king, Darius I. The scene depicts Darius defeating his political enemies and taking his rightful place on the throne of Persia. What's really important about this is that the king had the carving framed by a royal decree recorded in three different languages, Babylonian, Elamite and Old Persian. Scholars had been unable to decipher ancient Babylonian, but they already knew how to read Persian. Rawlinson realized that if he could find a way to record all three copies of the same decree, it might be possible to decipher the Babylonian and Elamite scripts. So he scaled the 200-foot rock face to record every detail. As a result of Rawlinson's efforts, it was possible to unlock thousands of documents already excavated from the ruined cities of Mesopotamia. Henry Rawlinson appreciated that the only way to make the inscription accessible to people so they could work on it um, later was to make a copy. Well, he couldn't draw it and, of course, he couldn't photograph it in those days with a telephoto lens, so what he had to do was to go up there and make um, paper squeezes. 
and then he describes the, how this was done to shinny up the ropes and press papier-mâché into the surface of the rock to make these squeezes, and then those were brought back and they formed the basis of the materials that the deciphers worked on. He was a courageous man because, as you know, it's very inaccessible, it's high up. Um, so it was a rather dramatic thing. You can imagine the wind howling and swaying and all that kind of thing, and uh, Rawlinson saying, no, you have to do every sign, and in fact, without uh, that inscription, we never would have deciphered cuneiform. And without his daredevil deed, the Bible would have remained our only historical source for the primeval world of Genesis. Here in the British Museum is a case full of ancient cuneiform tablets, one of which happens to be the most famous ancient document after the Bible. Discovered in the 1850s in the ruins of ancient Nineveh in northern Iraq, at first glance this broken tablet doesn't look at all important. But when the translation was first published in 1872, it caused an absolute sensation. This was the first time that a biblical story had been discovered in the records of another ancient culture. It was the story of the Great Flood. The 3,000-year-old tablet turned out to be part of the epic tale of the legendary Gilgamesh. It told the story of a great deluge and of a hero who built an ark and so survived the devastating flood. And just as with the Noah story, we read of birds being sent out from the ark in search of dry land. It's had a big effect because right from the outset, people were seeking for connections between the Bible and um, what archaeology could tell us. They were anxious to show um, that the biblical text could be supported from the ground, as it were. And so there was a fevered interest in anything which centred on the Bible, and this was a particularly spectacular thing. And the text, if you read a translation of the Gilgamesh story and you reread your Bible, they are disconcertingly similar. But for all Rawlinson's hard work, we still have a problem. Here at the source of the river Kerka, the trail of the envoy's route to Arata has gone cold. It's not at all clear from our ancient guidebook which way to go next. Three gates to traverse, but in which direction? I'm afraid we're going to have to call upon yet another ancient document to sort this one out. And the document in question is a clay tablet, this time in the Louvre Museum in Paris. It describes a military campaign against the kingdom of Aratu by the powerful 8th century BC Assyrian king, Sargon II. Like Enmerkar's envoy, Sargon's army also crossed seven mountain ranges, but in this case, unlike the envoy, we know exactly where he went. I, Sargon, king of Assyria, departed from Kalhu, and crossed the greater Zarb at its flood. I marched between high mountains covered with all kinds of trees, the paths of which never see the light of day. Seven mountains I traversed with great difficulty. I then crossed the Rapa and Arata rivers as though they were irrigation ditches. Against Surikash, a district of the Menean country, I descended. Sargon was heading for ancient Surikash, which lies under the Kurdish town of Sakez on the Menean plain. He travelled north through seven mountain passes, across a river Arata, and arrived on the plain or Idin of Urartu, the biblical Ararat. Enmer Kar's envoy also travelled north through seven mountain passes and ended his journey on the plain or Idin of Arata. It's surely reasonable to assume that they were going to the same place. And so that's where we need to head next, over the three remaining and highest mountain passes and on down into Arata, Ararat and the land of Eden. With the help of Sargon, we found the location of Arata and the final destination of Enmerkar's messenger beyond the seventh mountain range.
When the envoy reached the seventh gate, he knew his journey was nearly over. Beyond lay the plain, the Edin, the biblical Eden, and the magical kingdom of Arata. Paradise beckoned, and he was in seventh heaven. Our destination, the land of Eden, lies before us. But what will we find when we finally return to paradise? We've followed the route of an ancient envoy through the seven gates which lead to seventh heaven and the brink of paradise. As we approach the great salt lake of Urumia, we're finally entering the land of Eden, hardly changed in 5,000 years since the time of Enmer Car and even 2,000 years earlier, the days of Adam and Eve. Beyond those peaks due east of here should be the Garden of Eden. But before we step through into paradise, I think we should take another look at those original clues in the book of Genesis, just to be sure we're actually here. If this is Eden, then we should be able to find the two missing rivers, the Gihon and the Pishon. We should be able to find the lands of Cush and Havilah, and of course, the river of the garden. Let's take a satellite view of this world of Eden and the regions which surround it. To the east of the great lake known as Urumia, in the east of Eden, as the Bible says, is a long fertile valley protected by high mountain walls on its northern and southern sides, a walled paradise garden on a massive scale. The western end of the garden is bordered by the marshes of the lake. At its eastern end, a pass or eastern gate leads to the outside world. And through the valley runs a river, the river of the garden, which flows into the Great Lake. To the north of the garden is a fertile region through which run several tributaries of the river Aras. But this river has a much older name. At the time of the Islamic invasion of Persia in the 7th century, Arabic geographers referred to it as the Gai Hun. If you remember, the Bible tells us that the Gihon flowed through the land of Kush. And early Christian scholars concluded that this was the land of Kush in Africa. But believe it or not, the ancient name of this region through which the Gai Hun flows is also Kush. And that mountain up there, even today, is still called Kush Adag, the mountain of Kush. There can be little doubt that the Gai Hun and the biblical Gihon are one and the same, and that this is the real Kush of Genesis. And so we've identified the third of the four rivers in Genesis which pinpoint Eden. The location of the fourth river also slots into place just where you'd expect it in the southeastern quarter of our map. It's the river Kezel Uizan, which if we're right, the biblical author called the Pishon, winding all through the land of Havilah, rich in gold. Gold is still found in the Kezel Uizan today. Indeed, the word Kezel means golden, the golden Uizan. But how can Uizan be the same as Pishon? The answer, as language experts have suggested, lies in the transcribing of an ancient Iranian name into Biblical Hebrew, which is a Semitic language. For example, the ancient Menean city of Uishderi is today known by the Arabic name of Pishdeli. The Iranian letter U has become a Semitic P. In the same way, the old Iranian river name Uizan has been converted into Semitic Pishon by the biblical author. Now the last piece of the geographical jigsaw puzzle. Remember the biblical story of Adam's two sons, Cain the farmer and Abel the shepherd. Cain and Abel were instructed by their father to make an offering to God. Cain brought the produce of the fields, whereas Abel sacrificed the lamb. 
and won God's favor. Bitterness and resentment grew in the heart of Cain, and in a fit of jealousy, he committed the most grievous sin of all. As a result of this first recorded murder in history, Cain was exiled from the Garden of Eden. Be cursed and banished from the ground which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood at your hands. When you till the ground, it will no longer give up its strength to you. A fugitive wanderer you will be on this earth. And so Cain left Yahweh's presence and settled in the land of Nod to the east of Eden. And that's the crucial bit of the text, in the land of Nod to the east of Eden. Amazingly, the eastern region of our map bears the names Upper and Lower Nocti, and Nocti means belonging to Noct. Could this be the Nod of Genesis? It was common practice for the biblical writer to change foreign names into Hebrew words. Nod simply means wanderer, and Cain was indeed a fugitive wanderer. We found the rivers Gihon and Pishon, and even perhaps the land of Nod. It's now time to make the final step into paradise, westwards into the Garden of Eden. The Valley of Tabriz beckons, and we're ready to return to Paradise Lost. So Yahweh expelled man from the Garden of Eden. He banished him. We're returning back along the road of banishment, which brought Cain and later Adam out of the garden into the harsh world beyond. In front of the Garden of Eden, he placed a fiery flashing sword and to guard the way to the Tree of Life, he posted the cherubim. We think of cherubim as sort of podgy little angels with wings, but uh, we now know that they are the Kuribu of ancient Babylon and Mesopotamia, which were the guardians of sacred places and temples. So if you go to the British Museum, you can see a lot of cherubim, and they are great winged creatures to frighten you. And that's the function of the cherubim in the Garden of Eden, is to keep Adam and Eve from entering, um, because this is their punishment for disobeying God. We're finally entering the Garden of Eden through the Eastern Gate, the Road of Banishment. It's an extraordinary feeling, actually, thinking that we're going back to the place that Adam and Eve left 7,000 years ago. Once we get down into the Valley of Tabriz, we see that the Garden of Eden has disappeared forever desecrated by modern industrial man. In a sense, the biblical prophecy that man would never return to paradise has come true. The garden now lies buried beneath this vast urban sprawl. But there's one place that humankind has not yet destroyed. In the Bible, the book of Ezekiel tells of the fall of man from the mountain of God in Eden. There is a large mountain overlooking the valley of Tabriz, the volcanic dome of Mount Sahand. And on the slopes of this mountain, 
you can get some idea of what the primeval world of Adam was like. If you believe in the literal truth of every word in the Bible, then you don't really need me to prove that the Garden of Eden was a real place. If, however, you see the Eden story as a poetic metaphor, the question is, what could it be a metaphor of? Why should this location, rather than any other, be identified as the place from which man originated? The Bible places Adam in Eden about a thousand years before the first cities were built in ancient Sumer, towards the end of the Stone Age. So from that point of view, who was living here at that time? Archaeology has revealed the valleys of the Zagros Mountains in western Iran to have been crucial locations during the Neolithic Revolution. But why do anthropologists see this as such a momentous era in human history? The Neolithic Revolution was probably the most important breakthrough that humanity's ever made in terms of change of life because uh, it's basically the foundation stone upon which the historical civilizations are built. We're basically talking about the beginning of farming, the beginning of the domestication of animals, growing crops in the fields around a permanent village. Now it wasn't long before these villages became towns and eventually these towns became cities because without farming there would never have been a city on the face of the earth. We are the inheritors of that Neolithic revolution, so this really is our point of origin. Not surprising then that this is the location for the creation story. And here, near the summit of Mount Sahand, in the troglodyte village of Kandavan, you can almost touch the primeval world of Neolithic Adam. We learn from the creation mythology of ancient Mesopotamia that man was created in the likeness of the gods by combining the clay of the earth with the blood of a slain god. And the Neolithic people here used the red earth or clay in their rituals, taking it from the red mountain overlooking the garden. Our main knowledge about the use of red ochre is in burial rituals. Uh, the bodies were covered with red ochre um, and sometimes just the bones. And I think what this shows is, is the symbolism used by uh, early human beings. As we're born into this world covered in blood, so when we leave this world and go to the next world, we are also to be covered in blood, which the red ochre symbolizes. According to the Bible, Adam too was made of clay. In fact, the name Adam means red earth. But what of Adam the man? Perhaps fewer of us today are prepared to believe that he was the first human created by God from the clay of Eden. But did an historical Adam ever exist? He certainly did in the mind of the Genesis author. He is simply the tenth generation before Noah, and that's as far back as anyone could go. Adam existed because he was remembered by his descendants, and he was the first spiritual man, the first to communicate with his God. We may not be able to truly return to the earthly paradise, but at least by means of modern television magic, we can restore the valley of the garden back to its primeval beauty, just for a glimpse of what Adam's world was like. Climatologists tell us that westerly winds brought warm air from the Mediterranean, creating a microclimate in the long, narrow valley. The extra moisture encouraged dense vegetation growth and an amazing variety of fruit-bearing trees, enticing to look at and good to eat. In the deep red soil covering the foothills, orchards of apple, apricot, pistachio and almond grew in abundance. Wild vines entwined the sloping terraces, heavily laden with bunches of sweet green grapes. One of the Mesopotamian words for vine is the word used in Genesis for the tree of life. And through the valley flowed the river of the garden, on its way to the marshes of Urumia. 
This truly was a paradise on earth. My journey ends here, at the mountain of God, the place from which Adam, whoever he was, and the rest of his tribe were cast down, exiled from the Garden of Eden to wander this earth. But this was just the beginning. The epic tale of the people of Genesis continued for thousands of years, 